brakes again, have to go gear down again. Since you tapped the brake, it was letting the truck know that we were still going faster than you wanted it to go. Right. So now in second gear, it's holding our speed there without any applying any brake. We're going about 37. And we are in fourth gear, just under 3,500 RPMs, and we're staying right at 50. And I'm probably pushing the pedal, I don't know, 50%. Like the dump station. This is my this is big on my pet peeves. Never fill up with water at the dump station. Are you any happier than a few minutes ago? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is going on back here? Towing the first time for four and a half hours. How's the hitch look? How'd it do? It looks really good. Some people said about the Anderson hitch that on rough roads or if your bed doesn't have the bed line or it kind of rotates on you. Ours didn't move at all because I have it lined up exactly with the bed design. So I would know if it would move and it didn't move at all. And we were on some really rough roads. So I'd say if it, if it held on there, it's going to be good. And it was a nice smooth ride, so that was nice. Um, well, was it a smooth ride or was it a rough ride? Well, the roads were rough, but on the smooth stretches, the hitch did a nice job keeping things smooth between the truck and the camper. So on our left is a brand new Ford building that they're currently working on. It's all steel at this point, but they said it's gonna be offices and assembly for the new Ford F-150 Lightning truck. Hi, Chad and Jennifer here with the F-350 Godzilla Super Duty. And this video is about our first long trip with the heavy camper. If you're new to the channel, we just purchased this F-350 Super Duty with the 7.3 liter gas Godzilla engine after having some poor experiences and some good experiences with our previous Super Duty diesel. You can check out that video in the link up above and down below in the description about why we switched from diesel to gas. But this video is about our very first time towing the camper a long distance. We previously did a, a video about our first impressions of towing that was just kind of a test drive with the new Anderson hitch and the new truck towing the camper. This is our first actual excursion with the 7.3 to 
towing a 12,000 pound fifth wheel about 625 miles on the Godzilla engine towing the camper once we get home. But this first trip here to Dearborn, Michigan, we wanted to make a trip to Dearborn to see the F-150 factory, the Greenfield Village, the Henry Ford Museum. There's a lot of stuff to do here. We stayed at Sterling State Park, so there's Lake Erie Beachside right along the side of us. And this, like I said, first time towing the camper with this truck, I was really impressed. So I'll say right off the bat, you can tell it's not a diesel. There are some differences. Um, we'll talk about those, but we'll also talk about things we really liked. And I liked a lot of things about the 10 speed transmission, the gasoline engine being so quiet. And I thought maybe we would, you know, hear that engine a lot louder going up hills. That was not the case. That 10 speed keeps us in a nice range the entire time. And the 10 speed, the nice thing about it is you can you can tell what level gear you want to be at maximum. So if you don't want to go above eighth gear, you can use that gear selector and gear down to eighth and below all the time. We left it in 10th gear. Michigan and Ohio is pretty flat. So we didn't have a lot of uphill grades to climb. When we did climb any type of grade or accelerating on the ramp, plenty of power with the 7.3 Godzilla. We could get right up to speed, no problem at all. I actually like that V8 rumble of the engine when you put it under a little bit of a load. I thought it sounded really good. And this is the stock exhaust. So, you know, even with the stock exhaust that I think has three mufflers or resonators going back uh, the exhaust system, it sounds really good. What did you think of the first time towing? I was afraid that because we've had the diesel and switching to a gas engine and everybody says how much power you lose that maybe we would feel like, you know, there were parts of the trip that maybe the truck wasn't going to make it, but not even close. The truck had plenty of power anytime we needed it. I just think probably being in a diesel for 17 years, Yeah, that was just my concern about it, but I thought it did a good job. And like I said before with the truck, even with the camper on the back, on the interstate driving, even when you were going 70, 75, I didn't feel like we were going over probably 55 or so. And I really like that in this truck compared to the last truck because it makes me less nervous. Yeah. The, the major differences that I've seen um, were the downhill braking. So there were some grades we come down and because you don't have that diesel compression brake braking as, a, as an option in tow haul mode, the gas engine tries to do the same thing and as soon as you tap that brake pedal, it gears down. And there were a couple times coming down hills we were in third gear. That probably wouldn't have been the gear I would have selected because it really races the engine at, at four or 5,000 RPM. Yeah, when, when you're not expecting it and you just barely tap that brake and it gears way down to help slow down that is the function of it to help you slow down so you're saving on your truck brakes and your camper brakes but it you know if you're not expecting it, it makes that that steep gear down from ninth or tenth gear down to third or fourth gear that's a little bit of a, a unexpected noise level increase and slow down but that is what it's in, it is intended to do and it, it does a nice job slowing down it's just if you're used to the diesel compression braking or the exhaust braking if you have that in your truck this will be an adjustment for you as far as gas mileage, I know this is everyone's biggest concern. It was certainly my big concern switching to the gas engine. Um, with the 6.0 diesel, we usually would get 11 to 13 miles per gallon towing. Now, if you're in the mountains going towards Yellowstone, we were on the low end of that spectrum, 10 or 11 miles, because there's a lot of grade up and down. But of course, this is you know a unique situation coming across flat Ohio, flat Michigan, not a lot of grade. But we got between 9 and 10 miles to the gallon. Uh, our current trip for this so far on the trip is at 10.2 miles per gallon. Now some of that was not towing the camper. We drove to and from Dearborn three times, so that pulled our average back up a little bit. But so far on the trip, 10 point some miles per gallon after towing the camper. Most of the time towing, I was watching the instant MPG and we were in the 9 to 10 range, usually about 9.8 if I had to average it. So, you know, not, not great, obviously, but we're towing 12,000 pounds with a big truck. So that's about what I expected. Honestly, I actually wondered if it would be lower. I thought we might be at 7 or 8 miles to the gallon, so we, I was happy. Maybe we will be when going out west sometime. But. Yeah, so if we go out west and we're on those inclines, we may decrease that average a little bit. But probably, too, with the price increase in diesel, diesel. compared to gas. 
it's a it's a wash. We have to do the math on it. But. Yeah, I think I think it's probably a wash between the price increase of the diesel fuel versus gasoline and the price increase of the diesel engine versus the gas engine. And you did find you were worried about it switching to the gas engine. That's a great point. I'm so used to you pulling to any high bay at a truck stop and you're going to have diesel fuel right there available. I thought, uh-oh, right what, what if we wouldn't find a place that we could get gas at a high bay, but the Ohio Turnpike truck stops have at least two high bay pumps that are gasoline, so that was good. Mm -hmm. um, I think probably the further out west we go on our travels, that may not always be the case because there were some times going to Yellowstone that we really struggled through, to find diesel. Going through Montana, Montana. and North Dakota, mm -hmm. there yeah, were the, times where you didn't find a gas station for long periods of time. Right, and that's one of the reasons we chose the long bed was so we'd have that 48 gallons of gas capability. I think that was probably a wise choice. The other thing I'm really enjoying about the long bed is I don't have to worry about the camper as much on those turns. The Anderson hitch, I think we have it set up the proper way in our situation with the cup facing backwards rather than forward. And that gives us a ton of room still in front of that fifth wheel between the fifth wheel and the cab and the fifth wheel of the bed rails. So I think that's the proper setup for us. The Anderson hitch did a great job. Um, nice and smooth. That was another thing I really, you know, I couldn't tell whether to attribute it to the new truck or to the new hitch. But I'll say that I think it's the hitch because you're a ball in a socket. It's so smooth. None of that chunking that I'm used to with the conventional fifth wheel hitch. So I am really happy about that. I'm also happy with the height adjustment of the ball on that Anderson hitch because I was able to level out the camper behind us so that there's plenty of gap between the bed rails and the fifth wheel overhang. So that's really nice. Another thing that I was a little bit worried about with the new truck was the braking. Um, I wasn't sure, you know, are the, the brakes of the F-350 still the same as they were in our old truck? Our old truck was the camper and snowplow package and, you know, all those packages. This does have the camper package and the brakes were phenomenal. I thought, you know, even if we, if for some reason the trailer brakes would fail, the truck has enough braking to stop us in an emergency. And especially considering that engine braking that happens when you tap the brake pedal. If you watched the previous video, that we did about the tonneau cover. It was really nice to have the tonneau cover. I do have the hitch under there, the generator under there, some tools under there. So our three days going to Dearborn, it was nice to be able to roll that tonneau cover back and have all that stuff protected from the weather, the sun, and anybody just seeing yeah, it the, in the bed of the truck. The tonneau cover looks sharp. The tonneau cover looks really good. We went through some heavy rainstorms, no spots where it was sagging and leaking. So that was nice also. And this is the one of the cheaper models of a tonneau cover. Yeah, this right. this, in, I'll put the link up above to installing the tonneau cover. This is the Truxedo Truck Sport tonneau cover. It was about $350 off of Amazon. I'll put that Amazon link down below. If you want to order it through there, we'd really appreciate it. it gives us credit for sending you to Amazon, but doesn't cost you any extra. But the Truxedo was one of the least expensive options. And the only option that I found that would work for us to be a little bit above the bed height so we could still fit our generator back there, our Honda EU 3000 generators taller than what one of those flat or flip uh, bed, bed covers would handle. So great for our situation. So here's a view of that trip so far. You can see we are currently at 11.4 and like I said that average is skewed high because we did about 30 miles each day uh, to and from Dearborn from Sterling State Park. So we did skew up a little bit with that travel. This is a navigation built into our sync system on the package that we have in our Super Duty trucks. Some of the Super Duties do not have navigation built in. This particular one does. So we had, an ex we had a chance to test this navigation system versus, for example, Waze or a GPS. So what I like better about this navigation rather than Waze is when we're, and I think we've got a little bit of video that you can put in, but when you're making a turn, I like how it gives you, it actually shows you which lane to be in. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I like Waze better because it does say your mileage, total mileage, and it does say your arrival time. And I know you can do the math, but I like how in Waze or um, Apple Maps or whatever that it tells you how long, like how long you're going to be driving. So this, it makes you do the math to figure out how long it's going to, your, your drive is. So if you stop somewhere, it's not going to show you what your old arrival time, how long it was. Does that make sense? Right, yeah. 
So one of the reasons that I chose an F350 over an F250 was because of the capacity. We chose the F350 with the 11,500 GVRW. That means that total weight on this truck is 11,500 pounds. Um, another advantage to the gas engine is that it weighs less than the diesel engine. So that means our cargo capacity on this truck, F350 long bed gas engine is 3,900 pounds. That's a massive amount of cargo capacity that can be on the truck. Now that's gonna include any people, equipment, and the tongue weight of your trailer. So in our case, you know, we have a 12,000 pound fifth wheel trailer. That means we're probably around 1,200 pounds of tongue weight on the back of the truck. So that means we also have 2,700 roughly pounds of capacity of the truck beyond the front of the trailer on it. And I'm, I'm always worried about that. I know I see a lot of trucks and trailers here and I actually did a video that I may have already posted or I may be posting soon about the trucks and trailers that we saw here. How many of them were F-150s, Dodge. Um, I'll put a link to that video up above. But I was surprised how many half ton trucks there are here. That would be a Dodge 1500, a Ford F-150, a uh, Chevy 1500, where in my mind, I think they've got to be over their total cargo capacity. Because if you're hauling a fifth wheel like ours and putting 1,200 pounds of tongue weight in your bed, plus you've got a crew cab with people in it, I'm guessing you're going to be at or over that cargo capacity in the GVRW of your truck. I've even seen, you know, if you watch Big Truck, Big RV or Keep Your Daydream, they've talked about how an F-250 is a little bit deceiving because you don't have a lot of times enough cargo weight carrying capacity uh, to haul your trailer by the time you get all your trailer loaded and that tongue weight, especially if you've got the diesel because the diesel is so much more weight on your truck that reduces that cargo capacity. So that was an advantage to choosing the 7.3 Godzilla was the cargo capacity increase by not having that heavy engine. So if you watched us on our truck video, there were a couple things that weren't must haves that we sacrificed to get this truck. One of those things was the center console. We really wanted the center console. Now, had we had the center console, we could not have taken six people to Dearborn that first day. So mom and dad rode with us and we had the two kids and Jennifer and I. So we filled six people, we folded this seat up and that gave us six people capacity. Obviously, if you have the center console, your maximum capacity is five. But we did hear, you know, we had some hot days of travel here. And if this had been a console, we would have vents back behind that would give air conditioning to the back row passengers. And Mackenzie did say a couple times that she wasn't getting enough air back there. We've got four vents up front here, and we try to do a good job, you know, dispersing those to the back, uh, adjusting the, the height and angle of them. But you definitely would notice it in the back, not having those vents if you're used to having vents pointed at you. Another thing that I'm really noticing that we sacrificed is the HVAC auto temperature control. I'm so used to in the old truck, you just tell it you want it to be 68, 69, 70 degrees. You hit that auto button and it does it automatically, maintains that temperature. In this truck, there's a lot of times where we're cranking the fan up, we're adjusting this temperature a couple clicks at a time because we're a little bit too cold or a little bit too hot and it just not is not as convenient as that auto button with the automatic HVAC control. And I was surprised the one morning that you needed to use the defrost and when you had the defrost going there was almost zero air coming out of the yeah. vents. So I made the choice one morning it was fogging up in here I hit the added the defrost to our front vent and you can actually hear that change probably it diverts most of the air up to the defrost which yeah. is a safety thing you right. want your you know if you need defrost you want that functioning higher but there is very little air at that point that comes out but I the think front this vents. is the only vehicle I've been in that diverts it that significantly because there's was literally almost nothing coming out here yeah. when you have the defrost going yeah yep um, as we haven't yet used the four-wheel drive we did use the plug here to power uh, my Fi for internet and I've used it to power my laptop so that's nice to have a 110 volt 400 watt inverter built right into the truck that's a really nice thing to have for doing some work and I still feel like I mean I've been in F-150s F-250s and really I just think the the Fords they have so much space space yeah you know, there's just so much there's so much leg room for the 
for the passengers for up here. I mean, I'm tall and I have I have plenty of room. Yeah. And another thing that I miss about the old truck, if we're talking about things we sacrificed, and it's, there wasn't a, a setup we could have chosen that would be different, but it's nice to have the cup holders here, but those fill up cr pretty quickly if you throw a phone in there or some extra keys. I miss having a little bit of cup storage here. We used to be able to pull that thing out. We could put our hand sanitizer in one of the cup holders and a cup in the other one. And I really miss, I knew I would, I really miss that driver's side glove box that was right here. I kept all my camp keys in them, my uh, padlock keys for things, anything that you know was something I'd access that I don't want to reach clear across to the other glove box or put it in this console, I'd keep in the little what I call the driver's glove box. And that was a great storage area that I'm really missing. I think that goes back to that if we could have upgraded the console to the console that we wanted, it had cup holders back here and cup holders and up cup here. And cup holders up here yeah. and some other little storagey areas. So. Yeah. The other thing that is nice about the console is you can actually add a safe into the console. So if you wanted to you know, put your purse in there or if you had a concealed carry or anything like that, it's nicely protected in an actual you know, vault safe in your truck. But I guess considering that there are not many trucks on the market right now to even find a truck mm -hmm. that this was as close as we could get to what we wanted without going ridiculously above our budget yeah and i absolutely love having the the trailer camera that high mount camera now obviously i've got my tonneau cover back right now so we can't see the hitch but it's nice to have that for when i'm backing up to the uh trailer so, I mean, I wouldn't say we have any regrets about buying this truck. No, we definitely needed a new truck. We needed a new truck for sure. I'm really happy with the 7.3. Um, I talked to people who own them and they said, oh, you won't even miss the diesel. I will say, I wouldn't say that. There are some times when I think I will miss the diesel climbing up those steep grades um, and the little bit of gas mileage difference, but I certainly don't miss the diesel fuel prices. I don't miss the diesel maintenance. And this truck has so much power that I don't even think I miss the power. So maybe I don't miss it at all. I definitely do like that nice V8 rumble that I hear in this when I'm towing up a grade. Um, and I like the, the simplicity of a, a, just a regular push rod gas engine that I know probably any garage mechanic can work on. Don't have to go to a dealership. Um, doesn't require tons of specialty training to do turbos, intercoolers, uh, high pressure oil pumps, any of those things. So if you're thinking about the 7.3, I can tell you after our first tow, so far, absolutely no regrets. It was plenty strong enough. Fuel mileage wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. Um, actually really impressed by it. We actually I met a guy here at camp who had another 7.3. And it's funny how you talk to each other about tow vehicles and campers. I was talking to him about his truck and he said that he lives beside the engineer who was involved with designing the 7.3 Godzilla. And the engineer told him, you won't have any regrets. Give it a try. And he's had it for three years he was an early adopter of that 7.3 he said he absolutely loves it doesn't miss his diesel at all obey traffic laws be alert and use voice commands while driving please proceed to the highlighted route and then the route guidance will start so i do have that camera and it is useful but i am so used to backing up and just seeing the bed that that's still where i focus when i'm coming back it lets me see the height I like to line up with the line here. Unlike the conventional fifth wheel, you've got to get this ball lined up pretty much in the center of that funnel. And I am right here. Let's say I stop right there. I am about an inch too far to the driver's side of the funnel. I can see that looking straight back. It's actually a little bit difficult to see, I think, in the camera. Can you see it there? Yeah, but I can't tell the depth of it. This is the part I'm not sure how I do when I'm older and can't climb over the bed of the truck. Because you wouldn't be able to hook these up without being in the bed.
to exit 1A, I-80, I-90, Ohio Turnpike toward Cleveland, Chicago. In point two miles, take ramp to I-80 East, then keep right. Stop. In 900 feet, use the right lane to keep right to I-80 East, I-90 East Fort Cleveland. If you're just getting into RV traveling, get yourself an easy pass. Not only does it save time, but it saves a lot of money. Because you get a discount on all tolls. Notice this guy got in the line without an easy pass. Yeah, this is supposed to be the easy pass only lane. This lane should have never stopped. Is he trying to turn around? Mm -hmm. I bet he's not allowed on. Take ramp to I-80 East, oh, then that, keep right. It doesn't really seem oversized. left, then use the left lane to keep left. It says auto Drive 1.5 miles, then turn left onto I-680 South. Maybe go around the side. I don't see any signs that say gas. So one of the things you were worried about switching from diesel to gas, not being able to find gas at a truck plaza. Right. So we're in a pilot. Make a U-turn. Then a, turn left on Ohio Machinery Boulevard. There was a turn sign left. that said autos then and turn RVs left on Ohio to enter. Machinery Boulevard. And the bay was tall enough for a camper, but there's no way that with this length of truck and camper, we could get to the pump and then out around the rest of all the pumps. So did you get your gas? Did not get gas at the exit we wanted to get gas at. The last exit in Ohio, um, gasoline is significantly cheaper in Ohio than it is in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania has one of the highest gas taxes. So I really wanted to get gasoline in Ohio before we get back to Pennsylvania but as was one of my fears the pilot does have gas pumps but not accessible to someone with 50 feet of tow vehicle and trailer uh, so that we couldn't go through the gas side so we went through the truck side hoping that just like on the Ohio Turnpike there would be a set of pumps for gasoline pickups like ours towing RVs that was not the case diesel pumps only so then I thought, well, maybe we'll go to the standby sheets. So we went to the sheets and it was just, it probably would have been possible to pull up to the end pump, fill up with gasoline, then back out of that pump and go around all the pumps to the exit. But you know, it's a busy gas station in the first place and it's hard to back up uh, from the pump to go around the rest of the building. So we didn't fill up with gas there where I wanted to. We still have plenty of gas to get back all the way home thanks to having a big 48 gallon tank. But that was one of my concerns is when you're towing a tall RV, will there be some spots where you can't get gas? And the answer is yes. So it has shifted us down to third gear. And right now it's just the engine keeping us at 40 miles an hour. No brake? No brake, but I'm gonna put the brake on right here. So I'm just using the trailer brake to slow us down for this turn. And it's just the truck engine holding us at this point. But we're still gaining some speed with the truck engine. There's not enough compression. It's again, it's a 3% downhill grade. So I'm wondering if I tap the brakes again, if it will gear down again. It's second gear. Tap the brake.
brake. It was letting the truck know that we were still going faster than you wanted it to go. Right. So now in second gear, it's holding our speed there without any applying any brake. Going about 37. It's holding back 12,000 pounds plus the weight of the truck just with the engine. Now if I apply the trailer brake for this turn, it'll slow us down a little further. So one of the things I've been impressed with with the 7.3 Godzilla is the towing power. I was worried about that coming from the diesel and I think those worries were uh, not necessary because this seems to have a ton of power. I'm noticing that when I'm pushing the gas pedal, so far I think I've only pushed it maybe 10% of the total push of the pedal, even climbing up some pretty decent grades. Now we do have a hill coming up here that I think is about a 7% grade, but I've got the off-road gauge on here, so we'll see exactly what that percentage grade is as we go up it. But that'll be a good indication and it'll be a good chance for us to listen to this 7.3. I really like that nice rumble it makes anytime it is under any load and I've only been pushing the pedal a little bit. So this will be the first significant uphill test towing 12,000 pounds. And your last truck, the 6.0, did have some difficulty several times on this hill. Yes, a couple times we ended up with the flashers on climbing this hill because something happened with the turbo or the injectors. So when it was running good, it powered right up this hill at 55, um, but when it wasn't running good, we ended up you know, limping up the hill. we're at a 4% grade right now and we are in fourth gear just under 3,500 rpms and we're staying right at 50 and I'm probably pushing the pedal I don't know 50% so I could push it more and we'd gear down to third or second gear I'm sure but we've got traffic beside us here too I don't really want to have to pass both of these cars, so we'll probably just maintain the speed. We're at 5% grade. Still no problem, fourth gear. Just slow down for these cars. So there's third gear to accelerate. So I think the 10 speed and the 7.3 have really proven to us, at least on this trip, we've gone so far over 700 miles and our current uh, fuel average, a lot of people are curious about that, is 10.9. So 700 and some miles, 10.9 miles per gallon, doing 12,000 pounds with the 7.3 Godzilla. Plenty of power, no regrets. So that's 70 gallons of gas. Thank you for putting that in uh -huh. perspective. Yeah. We won't do the math on the... On the cost. On the cost, yeah. There we go, over 700 mile trip. The 7.3 did a great job. I wish Ford would put some type of badging down here. You know, they've got that nice 6.7 power stroke. I wish they'd put a 7.3 Godzilla badge down here so that everyone knew what that great sound they're hearing from this truck is. It was nice. I do, I do really like that big, big block V8 rumble that comes out of the tailpipe and you get some of that interior resonance. Not not obtrusive but you know a nice mellow rumble from the big v8 did you appreciate that also i like that we have something that we can camp in yeah so the truck did a great job our our kind of maiden voyage on a long trip with the 12,000 pound fifth wheel trailer hopefully lots more travel coming up and you know the rest of this summer and next summer summer's kind of winding down pretty quickly here so probably just a trip or two left this year but then hopefully big plans for next year. And I know we could go on these trips, we could go drive there, get hotels, but 
I like that we've got everything here. We get to cook our own meals. It's just a different kind of atmosphere than being at a hotel. And definitely recommend Dearborn, Michigan for all three of those places that we went and toured. You know, the first time we took Mackenzie there, she was five. Um, and she didn't get to really appreciate the history, but she still had, I would say she still had fun. Right. Definitely taking her back as a 17 year old, there were different things that, you know, she was really touched and moved by the car at the museum that President Kennedy was assassinated in, um, the bus that um, Rosa Parks wouldn't give up her seat. Those types of things were really interesting to her. Especially because she's been learning the, about those events, you know, in her history classes. So now she can kind of put things together when she sees them. So now your video is about how did the truck do getting us there and back. But for anybody family-wise, I mean, we were willing to take an almost five-hour drive just to go to Dearborn, stay at Sterling Park, be at the beach, and definitely all three, the, the Rouge Factory, the museum, and Greenfield Village are definitely places that I probably foresee us going back to again. Absolutely. I just feel like every time we would go, we would learn something new. So yep. definitely a great family activity to do. And definitely a great truck upgrade. If you're thinking about the Godzilla 7.3, will it be enough to tow a big fifth wheel trailer on RV adventures like we've taken? I think that we've proven at least so far, this is a great truck for that, for that option. A little bit of a trouble, a little bit of problems getting some gasoline if you're not at, you know, a turnpike rest area we might have to figure out a better way to find places to get gas and a, and a big truck but as far as the capability of the Godzilla engine absolutely no complaints did great climbing hills it does help you slow down going down hills so hopefully those things help you out if you're considering this truck don't think that you have to have a diesel uh, a diesel isn't always necessary and maybe not be and may not be the perfect vehicle for your travels I think if you're doing just travel like we do this is a great setup and in purple collar fashion, we're home, we got the truck backed up, and now we need to go change and go to the cemetery. Yes. We've got work to do. Thanks for watching. If this video helped you out or entertained you, please give us a big thumbs up. We'd appreciate it. And if you're not already following Purple Collar Life, please consider clicking that subscribe button and following us on our adventures. It's not always about the truck, but the truck is part of the channel. Most of the work we do here is tractors, trucks, chainsaws, firewood, mowing, stuff like that that's necessary in rural Pennsylvania living. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again the next time. All right, so you've been wanting to redo this trip that we took about 12, 13 years ago and get back and see all those same sites again. What'd you think? That was really good. I think that the older I get, the more I appreciate the history that you can see in places like the Henry Ford Museum in Greenfield Village and the Ford factory. The factory was shut down, they were missing some parts. The workers were there ready to work, but the parts didn't arrive while we were there, so we didn't get to see the line in action, which was one of the fun things I remember from 12 years ago. You know, when the line is up and running, it's really interesting to see those trucks moving down the line and the assembly teams working on their individual uh, responsibilities for getting those F-150s built. The other I, part I think it's really neat at the Ford factory tour that you don't really think about how much thought process had to go into streamlining being able to build vehicles at a very fast rate. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting to see how they accomplish that assembly line. Would they say like a thousand yeah. over a thousand F one fifties a day? I think they said that. Yeah. Oh you thought they said a month. I'm not sure yeah. Let's look it up. But it was really interesting to see and they're building every possible configuration. Like I was thinking they would build all the regular cab, then all the super cab, then all the crew cab, but you may see a crew cab, Raptor, and then a crew cab, XLT. I mean, every possible configuration is just one one in a row down the line. So that, that was neat. The Greenfield Village, like I said, the, the older you get, the more you appreciate those things. So it was really neat to see the home of the Wright brothers, Henry Ford's favorite teacher's house that he had moved there to the village. Um, samples of different culture houses. There was a house there from England that was that was moved here. So lots of really interesting history that Henry Ford was able to gather. The first or a courthouse that Abraham Lincoln did his uh, trials as a defense lawyer in. Well, and really Henry Ford was really an innovator because he 
decided to create Greenfield Village like in the 1920s. Right. And so that was a time period where people really weren't interested in historical buildings or driving around to, to see those historical places. And I wonder how many of those buildings like the Wright Brothers family home and that one room courthouse and all of those places, how many of those places would no longer even exist because the small communities wouldn't be able to right. upkeep them. Yeah, it is really nice to be able to go to one location and see all that, and that they've kept it historically. Uh, you know, you're, you, you draw, you're walking through those homes, and then out on the road, you're seeing the coal-fired steam engine train go by, the Model Ts go by, the old Ford trucks go by. So it's all, you know, from basically that same era. And well, and there's nice. still skilled people in the village doing blown glass and the printing press and all of the, the farming. Yeah, so Greenfoot Village is a lot of fun. Definitely takes, in my opinion, longer than the two hours that the tour guides would tell you. <laughs> to leave a lot of two hours for the Henry Ford Museum, two hours for Greenfoot Village, two hours for the Ford Factory Tour. We gave ourselves three days, a day for each, and we spent probably six to seven hours at each location. And we still didn't see everything at Greenfield Village. Right. Keep the gap clean. 